everyone, it's Holmes from Home Story Books, and today I'm here to review The Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall. I've taken more notes for this review than a lot of other reviews I've written. I feel like I've come to know the protagonist, come to love her. Stephen Gordon, the young, red-haired, strapping lass who learnt to fence, learnt to box, and was willing to fight a boy from Eton because girls are better than boys. She has a temper as fiery as her hair, is initially seriously socially awkward, forever trying to prove herself against a world that isn't made for her. I loved baby butch Stephen, who had no idea she was unusual, until she did know. She felt shy, yet unusually daring. This book begins, as most books do, with the main character's birth. There's much description of the environment, much like Thomas Hardy. The seasons, hills and valleys and trees all become a part of the novel. Women are described as ivy, clinging and beautiful, and men are described as oak trees, and there's no need to tell you which Stephen would prefer to be. Morton, the country house where Stephen grows up, becomes a character in and of itself. Reading this book is like listening to an orchestra. There's lulls, highs, dips, crescendos. There's parts you do and don't like because of how long it is. If you don't like horses or animals, I thought I should forewarn you and say there are two fairly prominent horse characters in this book and a dog much later. These animals have thoughts and interact with Stephen a lot, especially in her childhood. The dynamics of her family are probably the most interesting part of her growing up. Stephen is friendless, lonely, apart from her father who vows to protect her. He knows she's queer and keeps it from her while her mother grows more and more distant from her, to the point of cruelty. Her parents begin to argue, to fight, as they've never done before, and Stephen believes it to be all her fault. It is bad for the soul to know itself a coward. It is apt to take refuge in mere wordy violence. I won't let her face your hatred alone. No matter the quality of the writing in this book, because of its trial for obscenity and subsequent infamy, it formed bridges for queer women that they could safely cross. In the Second World War, libraries lent books on army bases to people who signed their name in a ledger. If you looked in the Well of Loneliness, you could see all the people who'd borrowed the book and approach women who'd signed their name to it. All with her novel created a way for queer women to talk to other queer women without ever endangering themselves or creating suspicion. Many times, cheap lesbian pulp written and produced mostly by men, for men, said on their blurbs that their books were something like The Well of Loneliness. Radcliffe Hall carved her own path. This story is remarkably autobiographical in parts, and at times obsessed with martyrdom. The latter half of the book, especially the last 100 pages, are almost a moral monologue of what to do and what not to do as a queer person. How to survive in a place that does not make space for you, and yet the author runs into the same roadblock as always. Marriage, the right to own property, the right to have their relationship recognized as legitimate, the right to be called anything but a friend by the side of a dying spouse. Any passages that discuss this really affected me. I immigrated to Canada to be with my wife. At the time of our application, same-sex marriage was only available in Canada, not Australia. Legally, on the Australian census, I was single. Recently, we received a call from the Canadian tax office and had to clarify again and again that I didn't live with Valerie for two years of our relationship. I still get people asking me, why did you move, when they look outside and see slush, snow, and cold, biting wind. Why did I move from a subtropical climate, from the bluest skies in the world, and the best beaches I've ever been on? Because the slush, snow, the cold, biting wind offered my wife and I more security than Australia could at the time. Usually, people would shrug and say, okay, because they've never considered not having the right to be with the person they love. And even when it does have more rights in Australia, the Canadian immigration process is still relentlessly grueling. After the federal decision to allow same-sex marriage, the Prime Minister at the time, Stephen Harper, created a law so that any couples immigrating here had to have their relationship evaluated for their legitimacy. Because, you know, now the queers could get married, anyone could apply for the process. Now, of course, since November of last year, Australia has same-sex marriage at the federal level. It was a pleasure to vote, to say yes, and to see it succeed. I'm happy for all my queer friends at home, but also now that my wife and I have another option, and perhaps one day our children will too. But any time Stephen Gordon despaired at being unable to marry to provide security for her beloved, I felt for her. 
I have been to those crossroads. And yet through it all we have the character of Valerie Seymour, a French socialite who stood like a lighthouse in a storm-swept ocean. The waves had lashed around her feet in vain. Winds had howled, clouds had spewed forth their hail and their lightning, torrents had deluged but had not destroyed her. The storms, gathering force, broke and drifted away, leaving behind them the shipwrecked, the drowning. But when they looked up, the poor, spluttering victims, why, what should they see but Valerie Seymour? Then a few would strike boldly for the shore at the sight of this indestructible creature. I loved Stephen Gordon. I cherished her. She felt like a friend to me. I never loved her more than when Hall painstakingly described her evening routine. Combing back her hair with a wet comb, the clink of cufflinks, the starch of a stiff collar, meticulously buttoned shirts, cuffs, men's silk underwear. But Hall uses slurs and sometimes antiquated language to describe black people or Jewish people. I rolled my eyes. If Hall were born now, she'd be a racist turf of the worst degree. Her writing at times smacks of privileged, and I realized if she existed now, I'd make every effort to kick her out of the community. And in regards to her writing, most of the characters for their part do not come to life as Stephen does. Mary comes close, but for the majority of the novel, many characters are merely soundboards for Gordon. And somehow I didn't mind. I didn't mind any of the novel's flaws at all, because I loved Stephen so much. I felt like she was real. There were so many times when I wanted to pull her aside and ask her questions. I took to flagging the book with a mess of pink post-it notes instead. In terms of the overall plot, it moves slowly, sometimes it barely crawled. I feel that the queer people Stephen associates with were introduced too late into the book, and it would have been better to introduce them earlier, then introduce them again once Stephen had overcome her internalized homophobia, but that's just me. There's no telling why it was flagged for indecency. The word queer in relation to Stephen is used a total of 16 times. The word queer is used a total of 21 times, and the word invert, which at the time was the medical term for a queer person to describe someone as sexually inverted, was used 15 times. This last one, perhaps apart from the scenes where people of the same sex are described in bed, is probably the most damning of all. Queer has more than one connotation, but invert was specifically used to describe LGBTIQA people. Paul's bold use of the words themselves, never mind the characters, is incredible. And yet the only time she used the word invert was in warning, to say, this is what you shall become. If you're queer and you come out, you can never come back from that. You will be cast out. You will be isolated. You will be alone. Despite all your efforts, the world is not built for us. Even Stephen, who is described as having, above all, a grateful nature, is later described as having a hardened heart. Whether this book has a happy ending or a sad ending, there will be an element of bittersweetness, either in the fact that the author risked it all to publish it or refused to publish it until they could be punished no longer, in the case of E. M. Forster's Morris. I might still not care very much for many of the author's attitudes, but I loved Stephen Gordon. I still do. Paul warned us, warned us all, what stepping out into the world would do. Then she did the gayest thing she could possibly think of. She wrote and published this book. This book was a lifeline in its time, and I would argue, at times, a lifeline now. It reaffirms what I know down to my bones, that queer women and femmes have always existed, that we will always exist, no matter how society attempts to cast us out. Hall was angry, bitter, and sometimes full of hate. And in the midst of that, she created Stephen Gordon, who became a lighthouse for us all. That's it, that's all for this review, and thank you so much for watching. Bye everyone. <laughs>